Americans, Tower Bridge is a symbol like London survives, certainly. Plumed hats and scarlet coats are nice to look at. Old-fashioned delivery vans, which tourists hail as typically English, are jokes so old that Londoners don't notice them. Britain has your an ancient sign, in obsolete headgear on up-to-date heads. Winston Churchill has no prerogative in funny hats. The pretty English countryside exists. Sure, on either side of well-kept motor roads. The old villages retain their charm while modernizing their sanitation. Solgrave Manor, the home of the Washington family, is carefully preserved. Tradition is a living thing in Britain. Their own age, which they think is not inglorious, is enriched by the historic past. But into the old world orchard, a tractor is liable to charge at any moment. The real truth is, British farming is about the most highly mechanized in the world. This is how the modern plowmen homeward plod their weary way, while far into the night the British Parliament debates the nation's economic problems. Already Piccadilly is very much as it was before the war. The sight that the British haven't yet forgotten when the lights went out for six long years. All was darkness then, except for lights like these. The illumination of those years destroyed more than the historic buildings and human lives. Accumulated wealth was spent and the foreign investments of centuries sold to purchase victory. When victory came at last, Britain was flat, the station and dislocation of war. Accepting that friendly aid, Britain tackled a host of problems. Millions of homes were needed and needed fast. There were shortages of timber, building craftsmen, even at one time of bricks. And how much could be spared to build houses? when new schools and hospitals were needed. Or should factories come first to earn currency to buy timber? Homes were built by the government to be rented to those not with the most money, but with the greatest need. Food was rationed during the war so successfully that there was virtually no black market in Britain. Some rationing still continues in Britain. Everybody gets a fair share of essential foods at prices kept low by subsidies. As certain foods become more plentiful, the ration is increased until finally abandoned. Martial aid began by contributing a large part of Britain's food supply. But every year, Britain, working to the time limit of 1952, has reduced the amount of our martial aid requirement. The ration is boring, there's little variety. But the housewife in working class Jarrow, for example, feeds her family far better today than she could before the war. The food is there for her to buy, and now she can afford to buy it, because her husband's working. That's the result of full employment. These pictures were taken in Jarrow during the 30s. Factories cooked, the dry docks deserted. Go down the main street any weekday, and what did you see? All the men who wanted to be working idle on the street and all the shops closed. Now we're going up the same street, summer 1950. No workers standing idle, and the shops open again. The men are in the shipyards working full time and overtime. Money to replace just to get back to pre-war. But British foreign trade is far above pre-war and will go on growing. That means more ships are needed for British trade. The same story is true of 20 other countries which want British ships. This was good farmland and will be so again. Open cast mining is a crisis measure. It will be abandoned when the yield of underground mines is sufficient for the purposes. Good land is scarce in this country, so farms are set close to factories. Factories are, for the most part, modern, well-planned and well-equipped. For raising production per man hour is the only way to keep wages high and prices low. The British 
cotton industry was an early pioneer in the technique of mass production. Today, two-fifths of the raw cotton processed in British mills comes to Britain through martial aid. Britain is working hard to be free of the need for such aid by 1952. Scotch whiskey, on the other hand, wouldn't taste, couldn't taste half as good if the whiskey, like the bottle, came off an assembly line. More of the biddies say the men rolling in the barrel. They make the stuff, and they like it. But they, like other people in the British Isles, find it hard to get. Whiskey is one of the few things for which the chemist has found no synthetic substitute. And it rolls up a large credit to Britain abroad. Just listen. These are the Isle of Malt whiskies from the island of Isla. And these are the green whiskies. Since the war, it is rumored that people have offered good money for this job. Today, Scotch whiskey exports help to pay for the raw materials British industry must have. At export departments, prices are free from purchase tax, which doubles the price of some goods for the British. The customer is never wrong in these shops, and a wide range of high-quality British goods is laid out to attract his eye and dollars. He buys what he wants, or what his wife wants, that is. They have a bargain, and at the same time, a realization that they've saved themselves and other Americans taxes for foreign aid. But factory production for sale abroad is Britain's main task. Take tires, a rather essential part of an automobile. Rubber, Britain's greatest dollar earner, comes from Malaya, in the Stirling area. But carbon black, essential for hardening rubber, is a dollar product and comes from America through Marshall A. The finished tires are for Britain's cars, the largest export automobile industry in the world. They're needed for tractors, and Britain makes some of the most adaptable tractors ever devised. These tractors can be used with almost any farm tool. They are being sent all over the world to help underdeveloped countries grow more to feed their mounting population. Britain, for her own recovery, is exporting machinery which other countries need if they themselves are to survive. British automobiles are designed to give high mileage per gallon. While the world price of gas stays high, this is one of the reasons why British cars of good quality and low running cost will be in demand. Export is the word. And the demand for British cars is 17 and a half times greater than the present supply. For some times would find willing buyers in Britain, but Britain at the moment does not grow enough grain for her needs. So grain must be imported. And to help pay for that grain, she must sell other goods abroad. It's as simple as that. British goods on sale in American shops compete in price and quality with American goods. They are being sold to gain the dollars which will help keep Americans at work. Sold so that one day Britain will be able to buy all she wants of Virginia tobacco, American cotton, grain and metal. Every year Britain is filling more of her dollar needs with dollars earned and less with martial aid. The share of the American market, which Britain must win before she can make sterling and dollars freely convertible, is a very small fraction of the whole American market. Britain must succeed in gaining her part of that market by 1952. Meanwhile, for the food that comes in, manufactured goods must go abroad. That is the austere story written across every port of Britain today. But it's not all work and no play. Sir Francis Drake played bowls before going out to sink the Spanish fleet. His descendants play bowls before going in to sink a pint of ale after a hard day's work. Yes, 
time has many meanings for the British. By 1952, the British expect to meet the aims of the Marshall Plan, and their success will have effects beyond the British Isles, beyond Western Europe, even beyond the Commonwealth and Stirling area. American prosperity itself is linked to the recovery of Britain. Healthy.